Hello and welcome to topic 7 which is human rights of the indigenous people. Our objectives in this topic or module is to enhance our awareness of the issues facing indigenous people in Australia and by extension indigenous people around the world. We will be asking ourselves why is history important? That is how did we come to be where we are? And what has social work got to do with it? What role can they play? What what role have they what role have they played in history to get us to where we are? And most importantly, we'll be asking ourselves what are these human rights issues that are of particular importance to indigenous people? And again, important to ask ourselves what can we do? What role? have we got in this? And hopefully, at the end of this topic, we should be able to articulate the major human rights and social work issues that are involved in working with indigenous people. What we are hoping to achieve is cultural competence. What that means is that uh, you have the capacity to function effectively when you are working across cultures and particularly when you are working with people from a culture that is different from yours. So that means developing the appropriate attitudes and behaviors and having values uh, that can help you with that. And also we need to have policies that recognize the central role of culture. When you're talking about indigenous people, uh, you're also talking about uh, disadvantages uh, of people of uh, minority culture uh, where there is uh, a dominant culture that may or may not recognize uh, the values held within the other culture. And it's interesting for you to consider some of the myths that uh, surround those uh, issues and complications uh, when people are working across cultures. Uh, one is uh, racial discrimination. Uh, do you see that as a myth or a fact that uh, indigenous people have faced racial discrimination? Uh, what about historical oppression? colonization and dispossession and what role that has got. So do you see that as a fact or, or a myth? And what about geography? Uh, that living in remote areas and city fridges uh, causes a uh, disadvantage. Is that a myth or is that a fact? Genetic inferiority some people will say that it is in their genes, and therefore it's ine inevitable, whatever we do, their genes will always keep them down. Do you see that as a myth or a fact? Laziness. Some people will see uh, laziness as the explanation of, of, of the disadvantage. Again, I pose the question to you, do you see that as a fact or a myth? Uh, government policies that the disadvantage is to do with the government policies are uh, guided, of course, by capitalism and neoliberal policies that favor the markets of a people. Again, the question, do you see that as a fact or a myth? A uh, culture uh, that because of their cooperative uh, and collective culture in a in a society that's dominated by capitalist ethics, or what some people would call dog eat dog, is part of the, is the, 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 the problem. Again, do you see that as a myth or a fact? Now, going back to the human rights, when you're working with the indigenous people, it's very important to have an awareness of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which is the, the proper guide on how we need to understand the issues of the indigenous people. And 
in this declaration, uh, which I, I'll read, it says recognition, re recognizing and reaffirming that indigenous individuals are entitled without discrimination to all human rights recognized in international law and that indigenous people possess collective rights which are indispensable for their existence, well-being and integral development as peoples. So what we are learning here is that uh, all the human rights that everyone is entitled to also apply to the indigenous people. But in addition to that, or in order to realize those rights, we also need to recognize uh, their collective rights, which are important uh, for their existence and for their development, and again emphasize for them to realize the same human rights like everybody else. So we find that uh, in this uh, declaration, uh, the emphasis is on recognizing, respecting, and protecting the human rights of indigenous people. And also there is emphasis on equality. And uh, equality here means that people can be different in terms of culture, but they still remain equal. Uh, that diversity is, should not be seen as a problem, but as an asset. Also recognizing that uh, discrimination is harmful, has been harmful, and its continuation uh, will continue to be harmful. Also the importance of culture, heritage, blood, spirituality, and the importance of respecting all these aspects that are important to indigenous people. And you could pause here and ask yourself, how do we rate in Australia in these uh, fundamental issues? One of the issues that uh, we hear thrown about all the time is the issue of uh, recon reconciliation. Uh, what is it? Now, reconciliation uh, refers to bridging the gap between uh, the indigenous people and the non-indigenous people. Developing understanding, looking at uh, historical disadvantages, historical uh, issues that have separated uh, the two groups and seeing how we can build bridges. The question for you to ponder is, is it possible to achieve reconciliation without human rights and social justice for the indigenous Australians? Can we just go to the indigenous people and shake hands and say, now we are reconciled? Let's forget the past, let's look towards the future. Can we do that without addressing uh, the human rights and social justice issues? Just something for you to ponder. Most indigenous people would argue that uh, their disadvantages started with their dispossession. Uh, when they were dispossessed of their land, of their culture and of their rights. So the loss of blood, human rights and disrespect for their culture of the first Australians is seen to be at the heart of the problem facing the indigenous people today. Some of the issues have been addressed to some extent uh, in the last 30 years or so. Uh, and one of the landmarks of that uh, was the marble decision uh, for you who old enough to remember in 1992 uh, the court decided that uh, in that case between Mambo and state of uh, Queensland 
uh, that uh, indigenous people before the coming of the uh, white people had uh, had ownership to the land contrary to what uh, the law at the time stated that uh, when the white people arrived in Australia uh, people were just uh, wild you know say like animals and therefore the land was not owned hence the Latin uh, phrase terra nullius terra nullius means it's an uh, unoccupied land therefore anyone could come in and grab whatever portion they wanted either for themselves or for the queen moving on to the more recent past uh, we had the Royal Commission investigating uh, the death in, deaths in custody because of the high prevalence of a uh, number of uh, indigenous people dying in custody. And one of the people who was uh, uh, facilitating uh, the, that, you know, the, uh, that commission on behalf of the indigenous people is uh, Richard Franklard and he made a movie of one case, just selected one case uh, of Malcolm Smith and I highly recommend you see this video, I think it should be available on DVD so, uh, sorry, I, it should be available in the library it should also be available on YouTube I believe so you can watch it and see how things happened uh, with this particular young person uh, who was arrested uh, for a minor, what you call a minor, dis uh, minor offense. Uh, he had stolen a bike, uh, as kids do, and because of that, he was uh, taken away and from from his parents, and he never returned to them because he eventually ended up taking his life in while in custody and what you can see when you look at uh, that life is the the complete disregard of the authorities at the time because they felt that uh, he was not being looked after the parents had no capacity to look after him and therefore they took him you know, into custody and there he suffered and the family missed him and the reality was that the family was actually quite good. He would have a much, much better life if he had been left with his uh, family. And that brings up the issue of what role social workers have played and could have played at that time in taking the child away from uh, the parents. So in that uh, video uh, you look at issues of racism, what uh, issues of racism were involved in uh, removing Malcolm from his family, uh, the institutionalization, what role has uh, institu institu institutionalization played uh, in breaking up the families and in destroying the lives of these children? Uh, deprivation, uh, even though I say that the family was in a good position to look after him, they were still struggling, they were still deprived, uh, they had to survive by uh, shooting rabbits and stuff like that. And so that, that also highlights the issue of poverty and inequality. Like the bike he was, he was accused of stealing belonged to uh, the white kids who could afford the bikes while the, uh, the indigenous kids themselves had to walk and for them a, 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 a bicycle was a, you know, a precious thing. Uh, you can also see the resilience of the, the family, the father and, and the relatives, how they have been resilient despite all, uh, all the onslaught 
uh, from the other cultures and it would be interesting to know what human rights you observe uh, being abused uh, when you watch through the, the DVD. It's a, it's a long time now uh, since the, the Royal Commission, uh, but it demonstrated clearly the overrepresentation of indigenous people uh, in custody uh, uh, who ended up taking, taking their lives, but also the overrepresentation to this day of indigenous people in prisons. Uh, it was also found that uh, deaths in custody uh, were a result of lack of duty of care. And given that uh, those deaths are continuing to this day, it uh, would be interesting to know uh, whether we have made any progress. Uh, so I suggest you look at the Royal Commission, look at the recommendations they made, and see whether they are, they are being followed or not. Um, I think, uh, I think a, a review of that is overdue, so we can see uh, what is being followed and what is not. I personally suspect that not a lot is being followed, that, that uh, people have forgotten those recommendations, and it's probably time to revisit them. So when you're talking about human rights, it's also important, uh, particularly as social workers, to consider trauma. And trauma is uh, the damage that is caused to the psyche as a result of a uh, severely distressing event. And obviously, uh, being taken away from your family is uh, distressing. Having your child taken away from you is uh, distressing. And if you look at historically at what has happened to indigenous people, uh, where they have been removed from their land so that it can be developed uh, by the pastoralists, pastoralists, by miners, and I guess uh, other kinds of uh, developers, it would have been quite traumatic for them and obviously being put with strangers or in missions, uh, that was all quite traumatic. And trauma again can be a single episode, like an accident, uh, or one incident of uh, domestic violence, or it can be an ongoing uh, issue where you are constantly under threat, uh, like if you are living with a, a violent partner, uh, that is continuous, it's not a single event, because even when you are not uh, being assaulted, you, you live in that fear that any time, any day, uh, if you do something wrong, you could be assaulted. So that's when you, that's when, when you talk about multiple ep episodes, and uh, child abuse, domestic violence, war and colonial subjugation uh, are examples of uh, ongoing uh, problems uh, and multiple episodes uh, of repeated trauma. Sometimes you can experience the trauma as an individual, like if you have an accident, or it can be communal, where a whole community is under assault, you know, like if you are occupied or, or if you are in a war situation, uh, you face it as a whole community, no one is safe. Now the impact on the brain depends on the age, how, uh, the younger you are, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the, the younger is your brain, so the, the brain is uh, developing and therefore the impact is different from uh, somebody who is older who experiences the, the trauma. Uh, there could be personal factors, uh, of, you know, uh, resilience, how resilient you are, 
and also it matters whether it's a single event or repeated. It's much easier to recover from a single event than it is uh, uh, to recover from a repeated events. Now, social workers, as we mentioned before, they were involved in taking the Aboriginal children away uh, to end up in what we now call the stolen generation. Uh, social workers are still involved today in uh, child protection of uh, Aboriginal children. And the question that uh, is important for us as uh, social workers to ask is, uh, yes, in the past we have done bad things, but today can we be a force for good? Can we reconcile with the uh, indigenous people and demonstrate to them that uh, when we are doing child protection that we are a force for good, that we are there to help the community and not to traumatize them again. Now social workers have recognized the mistakes of the past and apologized to the Aboriginal people through the Australian Association of Social Workers. And you can see that uh, when you look at the Code of Ethics, uh, they recognize the indigenous people in the preamble. But what more can social workers do? What role can research play in highlighting some of these issues and identifying uh, what we can do? Can we also take di direct action in assisting the indigenous people? Uh, what about in our private lives? Do we keep keep on uh, accepting the needs that we have mentioned before being uh, continued either by government or by our relatives. What about at the international stage? We know that social work workers are involved in uh, working internationally, in international conferences, uh, even participating in the UN. What role can we play there in uh, promoting the human rights of the indigenous people? I suggest that uh, in the YouTube you listen to the speech by Paul Keating, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, I think until around 1996. He made this uh, Red Fund speech and it's really one of the best speeches by uh, an Australian leader and he talked about the role that uh, the Australian non-indigenous people have played in affecting uh, the indigenous people uh, in terms of introducing uh, diseases, discrimination and so forth. But I don't want to speak too much about it. I don't want to be distorted because it's a, a very good speech. So good that even Tony Abbott, when he was the leader of the opposition, considered that uh, he thought it was a very good and very meaningful speech. All right, I think that's all I, I want to say. I, I think there is a lot more that uh, is in the module, uh, so I, I suggest you look at the module. But now, in the remaining few minutes, I want to mention some things uh, about your, your essays, some of the important things that uh, you need to be thinking about when you are writing your essays, particularly in terms of uh, referencing and paraphrasing. Uh, referencing is uh, very important, but it's uh, also very confusing, I have to admit. Uh, and that's why I am saying here that it seems to be more of an art than a science in that it is not always uh, that exact. Uh, often even if you are to give to highly qualified uh, professionals uh, to reference the, a, a particular piece, they might uh, 
up different opinions of what needs referencing and what doesn't need uh, referencing. But the rule to follow here is that if you are citing someone's work, it's always important to reference. If it's your own opinion, uh, you don't need any reference. The problem here is that uh, sometimes your own opinion uh, might be reflecting some published work that you read some time and you have forgotten that you actually read it somewhere. The other area that uh, can be seen as a gray area is uh, what is uh, common knowledge and what is uh, and what is new knowledge. Uh, I have found that myself when I'm writing about something and I'm, I reference and uh, uh, my supervisor has said, oh, but this is common knowledge, you don't need to reference that. Then on another occasion I might omit to reference something and say, why is the reference for that one? I say, oh, it's common knowledge. And he says, common knowledge to you, not to me. So that uh, that's a, that's a, a dilemma in, in a gray area uh, for all of us that, uh, that are involved in writing. Uh, but because the view that you have may not be shared by your marker or your examiner in terms of what is common knowledge, um, it's better to err on uh, referencing even what you might think is a common knowledge. Um, but of course, if you are talking about something, you know, the sun rising in the east, setting in the west, you don't need to reference that. Uh, but if you're going to talk about um, why why the dog barks at night, uh, not everyone knows who, you know, why dogs bark, so you might want to reference that. I couldn't think of a better example, I'm afraid. Um, there are some issues uh, in terms of uh, whether you, you need to reference uh, information from uh, websites. Uh, and some people, uh, of course you should, but uh, how do you do it? Some people put uh, the URL on uh, or hyperlink. On the uh, uh, on the body of the, of their work, uh, and some APA uh, guidance may suggest that that's okay. Uh, but I personally suggest that uh, you need to stick with the author date and put the the websites in your reference list. I don't want to see any website. Uh, in the body of, uh, of your work. Everything to do with the information ab uh, about uh, the source, I want it in the reference list. I think uh, as long as we are clear on that and we, uh, whether it's uh, whether the, the guidance is something different or not, but you know my position, uh, then you are, you are safe. Uh, the other issue that I have talked about uh, in a, in a number of your, my comments in, in your essays is the issue of paraphrasing. I find that uh, paraphrasing is always much better than uh, direct quotes. However, that's not to say that you never use direct quotes. Uh, direct quotes are important when you are talking about definitions uh, or roles uh, that are very important and you don't want to make any distortion of that. Or you find something is a very pithy uh, information, and you don't want to have, you know, to take any risk in distorting it. So in that case, uh, a direct quote might be necessary, but I want that to be used very, very sparingly. I want you to read, understand, and then write it in your own words. That is what is going to be. That's what is going to get you uh, better marks. If you have very nice quotes from leading uh, writers like I, who writes very well, 
but I'm, I'm going to see that as Ives words I want to see your own words how you, know, how you make sense of that uh, not just uh, your admiration of uh, I that's not going to be enough so that is uh, my position on, on those issues uh, if you are still struggling I suggest that uh, you have a look at this uh, book Writing for Social Workers by a CSU academic uh, Angela Ragusa uh, it should also be available in the library uh, it is good in guiding you when you have not been familiar with uh, 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 writing in social sciences um, also contact Allen the people who support you uh, in writing, especially when you uh, find that you are consistently getting low marks, you're getting lots of uh, red ink on your uh, essays, I suggest that uh, you go to them, because uh, you are all good scholars, you have all got good ideas, it's just a matter of learning how to present them uh, accurately, and when you have been away from uh, academia for some time, uh, that's not easy because some of stuff uh, the way we do is not uh, completely common sense, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. Bye.